Welcome, everybody. We're going to uh, get started now on what I will biasedly call the crowning panel of our conference on accelerating environmental action. So environmentalism as we know it began in the 60s and the 70s. We've already heard reference to our first opening or our first Earth Day that took place. It was uh, 1972 that we got that Stockholm Declaration that said that as humans, we bear a solemn responsibility to protect and improve the environment for present and future generations. Uh, there's a much uh, quoted and uh, somewhat unknown where the source comes from, but, but comment that we do not inherit the earth from our ancestors, but borrow it from our children. Now, these are the sorts of things that we've been talking about, right? Since before I was alive, we've had global agreements on these facts, and yet uh, we know that the majority of the emissions creating climate change have taken place since world leaders came together in 1992 and agreed that globally we were going to do something about that. Uh, we talk since the early 2000s, we, we begin talking about Earth Overshoot Day. Of course, Earth Overshoot Day this year was on August 10th, but if we look here in the region, my understanding is that uh, it's early February that we hit Earth Overshoot Day each year, which is the the day at which we've used up enough resources that the Earth can actually produce in, in a given year. And so, hearkening back a little bit to uh, Malcolm Gladwell's talk, what we clearly need is, is urgency. And if we think of the you know, somewhat mythical storytelling that he did regarding Steve Jobs and Xerox, uh, in my mind, it is absolutely the younger generation that is going around talking to the older generation saying, do you realize what this means? And the older generation is saying, yes, yes, we realize what this means. And it is in fact the young generation that is injecting a sense of urgency that's needed. And so with that, we're gonna discuss here again how to accelerate environmental action. And we've got a panel of individuals who are themselves young, but more importantly are working with, with the youth in, in, in various youth organizations, various opportunities to empower the young. But, uh, in, and this, this includes Iman Duwaik from the Palestinian Women Water Network, Ashani Kotage from the Earth Commons Institute, as well as the Global Lab for Performance and Politics at Georgetown University. Uh, Nishad Shafi, who is a youth fellow at the Wilson Center and uh, earlier was a co-founding member of the Arab Youth Climate Movement, as well as Umaymi Ahmed, who is from Georgetown University in Qatar and the former head of the Sustainability Club on campus. And with that, Ashani, we're gonna turn it over to you to tell us a story. Storyteller. Her grandmother, forcibly expelled from her home and homeland in Al Burj, Palestine in 1948, would tell her stories. And as she listened, Fida would fly with her imagination across borders across occupation to freedom. And traditionally, women in Palestine told stories in private, not in public. But Fida tells stories everywhere, using them as a tool for survival, to pass on the anthropology of her people, to prove their existence and resistance. She's also a fellow at the Global Lab for Performance and Politics at Georgetown, which is where I met her. And she teaches arts in education, theater, storytelling, for anyone who would like to learn. The following story is inspired by and contains excerpts from Don't You See the Water by Fida Athaya from the We Hear You, A Climate Archive. In this story, I weave my own words with Fida's. I saw my friend in the Gulf of Aqaba. He swam beside me, slender and deep purple, ombre to pink. We looked at each other, and he stopped swimming. And I saw him again in a trio of lavender corals that looked like my eyelashes, thickened by my grandmother's mascara. And one more time in a bait ball. I waddled around a school, swimming spherically, 
gazing at its beauty, getting closer as they got bigger. But they were defending themselves from me. I was greedy to keep looking, but I had to avert my gaze, look away, swim away. You ever wanted to just float, just watch? Just north of the Gulf, my story takes place in the Jordan Valley of Palestine. The Jordan Valley represents 30% of the West Bank, and 88% of the valley is Area C. That means that this land is for Palestinians, but is under Israeli military law. When I was working in the valley, making theater with the communities, I heard so many stories from the communities under military law. It made me angry, sad, and even drove me crazy. I thought about the role of artists in situations like this. When I watched the people in the valley tell stories, they, they cowered. Were they just becoming even sadder by telling sad stories? And sometimes, yes. But what about the Jordan Valley before Israeli military law? One day, my team and I went hiking there and we found a beautiful salty river with a lot of hot springs. And if you come visit, maybe you can have a bath there or swim in the night in the very hot, salty water. Maybe that's something you've never experienced in your life. And next to the river, in the middle of nowhere, there was a traditional old hotel for people who want to enjoy the water. And on the side of the hotel, there grow many types of grass and wheat. There's even a water mill with a wheel for grinding wheat. The river is a natural resource for all types of birds, animals, and people. I was so happy to discover this place. So I called my friends who lived in Ramallah, Bethlehem, the Hebron area, in refugee camps mostly in the West Bank of Palestine. And I said, come, come, come with me. We want to invite you to this place that we discovered in the Jordan Valley. And so they came, a big group of artists. And when they got out of the car, they looked around and said, Fida, where is the water? And I said, oh, don't you see the water? And they said, no. Are you crazy? You can't see this big, huge channel? And they said, we see that, but it's dry. You are here to see the water. We are trying to bring back the life that we lost here. The plants, the animals, the stories, the people, the community. My friends looked at each other, and they looked at me, and said, are you just asking us for impossible things? No. I'm asking for every one of us to imagine. Imagine the past before the military came here. Imagine the salt water, the bathing, and the fun. So together, we imagined. And we also investigated. We went to the community and we asked them about what happened along the river. The people shared amazing stories about the plants and the wheel and the wheat and the flowers and the food and the dance and the songs and the amazing tea from a sweet, sweet spring. About the Cape Hare, the Indian crested porcupine, the Dorcas gazelle, all these beautiful things in this life. We also discovered how the Israeli military had planted a huge iron stick in the middle of the spring and how they would come by every day in a white car to measure the water levels. The local people didn't know what this was. They didn't know what the military was doing to the spring or how to stop them. But day by day, month by month, they kept coming. And then, kalas! The water started to go down and down and down, and then eventually, there was no more water. But sharing these stories, we felt in some ways that we brought the water back. My friends and I created an artistic trail called From Salty River to Sweet Spring, where we invited Palestinians and international guests to come and walk along the riverbed and learn some of its stories, gathering and soaring like the Admiral Butterfly. However, I never want you to forget that in reality, today, the salty river is empty. There is no water there. 
And that means that a lot of birds, animals, and plants are running away or disappearing, you know? Like the Arabian gazelle, the Buxton's jurd, and Anduin's gull. And a lot of people are disappearing. But to this day, just like the antelope that renews their horns every year, and the army worms who march from one crop to another in search of food, we are still walking, imagining, creating, and sharing our beautiful Palestine. Did you know why the Red Sea is called the Red Sea? She's a deep blue green until Trichodesmia meritrium dies. The algae dies and turns the sea brown, red, reddish brown, like blood from birth, like from deep blue green to like Kaliyama, red, hair to the floor, crown on her head, garland of skulls around her neck, dagger in one, beheaded man in another, don't spill, one more to hold the dripping blood and one more to point. Pointing is important. Look at what you've done and look at what you've made me do. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> Shani, for that uh, powerful and sobering story. And to kick off, we're, we're going to ask each of you all a question, allow you to introduce yourself a little bit more. But I want to start with you on, on the back of that performance. Would you say a little bit more to us about what performance art has to contribute to this conversation? We've heard all of these uh, panels, some of them technical, some of them uh, you know, policy-oriented, et cetera. So, so how does storytelling contribute to, to, to the goals of this conference? Um, well, hi, everybody. My name is Ashani Kotege. I'm a recent graduate of Georgetown University, where I studied science, technology, and international affairs. And I had a minor in theater and performance studies. So I, what I do now as a fellow at the Earth Commons in the lab is combining exactly these two things. And to me, there's two things that are really powerful about storytelling, period. <laughs> Tony Cade Bambara says the role of the artist is to make the revolution irresistible. Um, and I think that's exactly what artists do. They capture your conscience. You, um, if you're watching TV or a movie or listening to a song, you have, uh, they, it has your attention. And I think that's really powerful. And I think it also has the power to personalize things that are incredibly politicized, like including climate change, water issues, Oftentimes, they become a lot about the numbers and the data and the statistics. And stories add a human element, add a voice, also including to people, uh, to species and beings that are non-human. Um, so that's the power of storytelling, I think. And performance art, in particular, I think is very alive. Um, it's a part of it, it's an element of biology. I think uh, you'll see a student performance in a little bit, and those were written and devised by the students. They're constantly evolving. Uh, when you perform live, everything you see is happening in the moment. The set is being moved, the mic is being put on. It's not something you can pause and move on from. Uh, so I think it's really valuable in capturing the heart before you can go to the mind. Um, and I think that connection is really important in affecting behavior change. Um, so yeah, those, I think that's the value of storytelling. Oh, absolutely, I love that. And, and you know, this, this quote that you gave about the irresistibility that comes from it. Right? We're, we're talking here about accelerating environmental action, and we need that. We need that humanizing and irresistible element. Um, Umaima, I'm going to turn to you next and uh, talk a little bit about, you know, here in Cutler, Georgetown is seeking to expand its environmental offerings uh, and what it does, but a, a lot of students have to date faced what I know you have faced, and that is a great deal of passion for these uh, topics but perhaps not with as many classes as, as you might have wanted. So I want to hear how is it that you have navigated both sort of internal and external resources in order to increase your own understanding of sustainability? And then, you know, what advice 
might you give to others who find themselves similarly placed, caring about these issues, but, but needing to uh, learn more about them, perhaps if they don't have the luxury of sitting in college classrooms to learn about them? Hmm. Um, so, hi everyone, I'm Umaima, and I'm a senior major in international economics. And I started heading the sustainability club in my sophomore year. I started working as the vice president. Then in my junior year, I became the president. And yes, that's an issue that we don't have a lot of environmental courses at Georgetown. But I feel like if you have the motivational drive to learn something, you just make sure that whatever opportunity comes in front of you that's related to your interest, you avail it. And that's essentially what I did. So when I, started, uh, when I was heading the sustainability club, I made sure that I was uh, collaborating with as many organizations as I could. That's how I got to know about Arab youth climate movement, deep Qatar, and that also sort of acquainted me with the sustainability ecosystem in Qatar, essentially. And once I was done um, heading the sustainability club in my junior year, because you can only do it for two years to like, lead a club, I got interested in research, and that's when I approached Dr. Raha Hakim Duwar, and I started working as a research assistant, and I researched floods in Pakistan, and that really developed my interest in understanding nature-based solutions. And also, apart from that, it's also that if you do any internship, for instance, the internships that I did during the past two years, they were related to sustainability, but then there were also some programs that I was participating in that were not really sustainability-focused. Uh, but I made sure that I was extracting things within those resources that I could learn more about it. So for instance, recently I interned at the US Qatar Business Council and uh, they have a very corporate approach to doing everything. But I was like, how about I learn about corporate sustainability, the triple bottom line, and that's essentially what I researched there. So just about having the motivational drive, just availing all the resources and learning as much as you can. Yeah, absolutely, and I, I've heard other educators talk about uh, We've reached an age now where all classes are environmental classes mm -hmm. and all jobs are environmental jobs. And certainly that's something that your generation will, will be immersed in, right? No, Not just now, sure. yeah. but, but into the future. No, for sure, because the thing is that green jobs are increasing and for that you need green skills. Mm -hmm. And if you are an undergrad student, I think it's the responsibility of the university to make sure that you are learning those skills. So, yeah. Thank you. And Nishad, turning to you, you've had some success here in the region building up uh, organizations, harnessing some of the, uh, the, what we get from, from our young and, and helping them to, to be a, a constructive player here in the region. And I would like to hear more about your experiences, what advice you have, not just for the young, but for anyone who wants locally to be, to be involved. Well, thank you, uh, James, for that question. Like, it's, uh, it's a bit difficult in the past, but I think uh, the demography is changing. Uh, young people are equipped with the courses they needed, unlike in the past. Even sustainability was a very cliche in the past here in this region. Now we have a lot of spaces where you talk about climate change and environmental issues from a very pragmatic point of view. Um, sometimes the issues with the region, especially with the young people, is that sort of tokenistic approach. Like, if you want to be an environmentalist, just go to a beach cleanup, you become an environmentalist. So it's very tokenistic, your action oriented are very limited. So that's like how um, Omema was mentioning, the deep involvement of young people in the environmental issues are kept far away from the discussions, neither in the policy aspect, national building, what it has to do with uh, the national policy at international level. This was missing as a large part. So that was something prompted us like five years back to start Arab Youth Climate Movement Qatar in a way to bring young people under one umbrella because there wasn't any organizational setup. And uh, having an organized setup is something we focused from the very beginning because in the past there were a lot of youth clubs plotted out, but clubs immediately because they didn't have the institutional setup, mm -hmm. which is officially registered under the state's law. So that was a big barrier for many organizations to come up. I mean, till date, this is the same. But uh, some of the lucky ones like us uh, were uh, fortunate enough to move forward and setting an example to how an organization can systematically work, uh, building a bridge between young people, the government, other civil society organization. And something FYCM Qatar did was bridging the gap between the region and the globe. We reached out to every NGOs globally. Today, one of the big win for Arab Youth Climate Movement Qatar is that it's one of the known NGOs in the Middle East. That's because we connected outside the box but we did our work within the box. 
So we didn't try to replicate anything outside from the West brought to the Arab world, neither we wanted to sell the hay. But we showed a business model sort of thing, how it works. And I think that model is something many of the organizations within at least in the Gulf countries can replicate that within that box or with, within that limited um, uh, area where you can really focus on the work on environment and bring that youth, uh, youth uh, module. I mean, we've been fortunate to uh, be part of the Qatar's national delegation. Why? Because we did substantial work on the ground here, which is recognized by the state end of the day, and they get a bigger role to, you know, come and showcase what they've been doing locally at international summits like COPS. So I think the big learning lesson, big, big learning lesson is not to think very small, but look at the bigger picture and try to do something that fits the culture, the region, the people. That's the big win. You don't have to bring something from elsewhere and try to fit in here. And that was a big failure in many of the people have been doing in the past. And still people are continuing. And this is my takeaway. And bottom line is do something that fits to the local ecosystem and that will succeed because you will get the support. Right, thank you very much. And Iman, turning to you here, and speak a little bit more about what you see. What are some of the you know, main environmental risks and challenges that particularly face women and young people in Palestine today? Um, given, especially, it's such a sensitive topic and context at the moment, but I would love to hear not just what you've seen and learned there, but also how we can support and leverage the role of gender and youth in order to maintain a peaceful transition to sustainability in the area. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, well, regarding the challenges and risks, risks that uh, women and uh, youth face uh, in Palestine, Palestine is a kind of a different case uh, since it has been in, uh, it's, it's known, known as to be a conflict uh, zone for many years. So uh, the environmental pressures that, uh, that impact uh, women and uh, youth, um, it is known that, uh, the Pal that Palestine uh, environment uh, is facing many uh, challenges as, uh, as drought lo levels are increasing. Uh, it is expected to increase from uh, two to five degrees, which uh, will cause many also uh, destructive um, or will it will cause like more? Um, sorry, I'm kind of, it's okay. It will cause uh, more uh, like uh, less. It will cause less land for agriculture. Uh, also, it is uh, known that the rainfall will increase uh, from ten to fifty, from ten to twenty percent, uh, causing less clean, uh, more less uh, clean water have access to clean water and will also uh, destruct uh, the, the crops. Uh, now all that has also direct impact on women and youth since they are, youth, since they are known to be the vulnerable groups in Palestine. Uh, now how is, how is that? Uh, the Palestinian society is known to be an agricultural society uh, where women, uh, where their main income uh, resources of women is from agriculture. So when there is no access to agricultural land and no access to clean water, so then they are exposed uh, to these uh, environmental pressures and problems. Uh, and, uh, and here comes the importance of uh, taking like uh, mitigation strategies and resilience plans to avoid uh, this situation. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit more about the Palestinian Women's uh, Water Network mm -hmm. and how it came about and what it's seeking to do in this context. Well, uh, the Palestinian Women Water Network, um, it is a network that is three years old. Uh, it's new and a new network. It is hosted by the Palestinian Hydrology Group and founded by the Kavina Til Kavina Foundation. Uh, organ uh, the organization is uh, a Sweden organization and uh, it focuses on uh, women rights all over the world. Uh, now, our main focus in the network is uh, to um, make women voices count by different actors on the um, local and regional and international level, as we also focus on promoting uh, Palestinian uh, women professionals in, in order to participate more in, uh, in, the, in 
the making decision level and the policy making level uh, in order for them to have the ability to raise women and uh, use the environmental and water problems, which I guess the main problem is to obtain uh, access to, to have or, or to having access to clean and uh, clean water and environments. Uh, so uh, that is the main focus of the network. The network works with all uh, women in all segments. When we say all segments, we mean the rural and agriculture women, we mean household women, we mean also professional uh, women and expert women in the water and environmental sector. And we also target this uh, student females and uh, female engineer uh, engineers graduates. Uh, we also have certain programs for them. So uh, the network in general uh, works on empowering uh, women in the environmental and water sector. Thank you, thank you. So we just want to remind everyone, of course, you know by now that you can submit your questions there via the QR code uh, for our panel. And um, Ashani, I'm gonna come back to you, back to this idea of uh, storytelling a little bit. We heard from you know, Malcolm Gladwell, he emphasized the importance of framing and of sharing kind of the urgency that we have in a manner that others can receive it. And so talk to me a little bit more about the role of positive storytelling as a means of educating others, both with regard to the substance of, of environmental issues, but also as you were mentioning earlier, just a deep way of communicating urgency. Um, one of my favorite ways to demonstrate the importance of positive storytelling is by talking about ocean optimism. It's an emerging subfield in academia, and it espouses that positivity and sharing successes is actually strategic. Um, so it's not a type of toxic positivity or a foolishness, but it's a way to share these um, success stories and examples of things working and going right as a way to secure political capital, buy-in, financial capital, um, and all of that, because Currently in the media and entertainment, everything about the environment is very doom and gloom. Mm -hmm. um, but as a result of that, there's no hope. And when there's no hope, people don't want to try. So I feel like resignation is a collateral damage of this type of apocalyptic storytelling of the world is gonna end and we have no hand in fixing it or helping solve it. But things are, things are improving. Um, there's uh, rare sea turtles that are smashing nesting records in Georgia. Atlantic corals are spawning. There's also intangibles, like more um, people of the global majority, black, brown, indigenous people, more women being involved in, uh, in the decision making, but also in panels and conferences like this. So there's a lot of things that are improving, and Ocean Optimism talks about you know, sharing these stories. Um, so both in academia, but also in entertainment and hopefully in the classroom as well, where we're not just looking at problems, but we're also looking at examples of solutions that have worked. Absolutely, and I, I'm reminded of it with my students. I, I once had a student who came into the class and we were, we were talking actually about some of these positive developments that had happened, and, and he said, well, actually, I'm a realist. And <laughs> by realist, he meant he was a pessimist, right? <laughs> Uh, we had a good conversation about this, but this has been something that's been important to emphasize. If you are a realist, then you really are attuned to the positive developments. Uh, you know, if, if we look at where we're at and what we're facing today, it's a much better outlook than just 10 years ago when you look at uh, right, the, 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 the charts and the graphs and such of where climate change is headed. So I think that's, that's a critical element. Um, and, and I think it relates also, Nishad, you brought up before right, this, this opportunity here locally to work. You mentioned working within the box, and, and I heard two things from that, right? Uh, both working uh, kind of within the, the social structure as it's set up, but also being attuned to local opportunities and possibilities that, that exist here, as opposed to looking for models from outside and trying to, trying to import them. I, I would love to hear you be really pragmatic for a moment, if you would, and think about in your work to try to empower youth, what have you seen really work? When have you felt like the young have genuinely been empowered and not, as you mentioned before, uh, merely tokenized? Hmm. When it comes with knowledge, like a uh, colleague panelist mentioned, the anxiety issues which have been very well discussed in the West, it's not a concern here. We did uh, some surveys recently, nobody 
give a uh, thought about like it's a it's a thing like this. Yeah, I want to take an action, but I don't think it's uh, doom and gloom. I think positive positive things happen. And if you look at the um, education background of people who answer those questions, mm. are graduates and postgraduates. So, and if you look at the age group, they are 25 to 30. So this gives the number of people actually comes to the background, really understand the dynamics of climate change. And they feel there is a big hope that the transformation is still possible. But I never felt within the region there has been a, quite a big discussion around uh, mental health and climate. I recently see a lot of discussion happening, which is, was not part of. Uh, and that is a good thing because um, uh, we've been hearing a lot of uh, burnouts and uh, young people are part of the climate movement within the region. But again, coming back to the contest here, what is something missing is that uh, really empowering people with the right knowledge, uh, not mere academic. Because academic things stays in academic and with the paper. But what we really want to build is that paper with the real world knowledge. Like you get to see, feel it, what's happening. Like the other you were mentioning, we're going to find the whales and the stories about sea level races you have to show in real. Because people used to quote still in these days in this part of the world, What's climate change is flooding in Bangladesh and forest fire in California. Now we have flooding in our own nations here uh, in the, and we, we have also a loss of lives in some of the countries here. Forest fire is as close as in Lebanon and in Turkey. So those real examples are coming closer and closer. That means we are getting the impacts of climate change are very real and faster than we thought. And also that people start realizing, oh, these things are happening now in a very technical way. They understand the topic. So if you look at that, real part of people who are part of the real conversation are the real people with the knowledge, and they're the one who really want to join this sort of movement. Even when you look at the members in many of the organizations in this part of, the, part of this world, or our organization, are mostly students from the science and environment background. Half of the students in my uh, are in the program are uh, environmental science students from Qatar University. Mm -hmm. I don't find somebody coming from computer science and joining. We welcome everybody, but th that shows that people equipped with the knowledge feel like, hey, I have something to do and I have a say there. So I think we try to take the science outside the environmental science students' portfolio so that we bring the rest of the people together. Yeah, and this, remind me, this gets back to what we were talking about earlier, remind me about making sure that we have the classes, mm -hmm. there, right? We're making sure that we're, we're getting this education, we're, we're getting this out. I think sort of staying on this, this topic a little bit with regard to uh, a kind of paternalism or tokenism that can happen, Iman, uh, I would like to ask you, as we seek to incorporate women and youth in, in, in the goal, <clears throat> with this, this goal that we have of genuinely empowering them, how can women and youth be more integrated into the system of, of climate governance rather than merely uh, sort of be, be picked as a, as a mere token or as a mere symbol of the fact that we're, we, we're trying to incorporate women and youth? Yes. Well, um, as the network, um, we we do we do uh, deal with uh, all uh, women and all all levels. Um, it is very important to uh, to assure that participation of women in water governance and also environmental issues. So uh, that's why we um, try to create uh, create uh, programs and. Uh, and activities that uh, help them uh, to like. Uh, to have the right skills and uh, abilities and knowledge of uh, their right for water and uh, for right to have a clean environment. Uh, also, it is very important us to to in this uh, situation to uh, gather all stakeholders uh, in one uh, in, in under this platform or this network where they could dialogue and discuss safely uh, their needs and wants as women and uh, their rights. Uh, so that the, that, that the top level management could hear them or that the Palestinian Authority can hear them. And by that, we could like, uh, it could be more uh, included in the Palestinian Authority agenda mm -hmm. when we talk about water and environment or when we talk about uh, uh, gender related issues. Um, it is all, it, we also uh, focus on a cap city building for, for, for um, professional women that work in the, the water and environmental sector. Mm. Uh, so uh, as we also work on uh, the female students, graduate students, um, especially the ones that do have like uh, the, the eager to know more about water and, and environment and, and also diplomacy and policy making. So 
we try to uh, connect all these stakeholders together where they could exchange knowledge and where they could hear each other. And then uh, based on that, we uh, do out the envi environmental strategies uh, are, are, are created within a gender perspective, including women and youth in, the, in, the, in these strategies and policies. Absolutely. So that, yeah. that, that critical feature of capacity building yeah, has to be there. And you've been able to, of course. to do that. Um, yeah. Umaima, I'm going to turn to you again. So we, we've heard a whole lot about water. We know the precious commodity that it is. We know how important it is with the, the various issues that we've discussed, security, biodiversity, food security, uh, the, the COP28 goals. Um, it's an enormous challenge. And, and, and at the same time, it is also one of the, the consequences. Somebody else earlier today said that if, if climate change is a shark, then uh, water is the teeth. And I think we've seen that in, in Pakistan here recently. And I know you've done a lot of research around the flooding in Pakistan and some of the challenges that are there. Could you tell us a little bit more about what you've learned? So, um, first of all, the research was, I think, uh, one of the things I did that really allowed me to like push myself out of my comfort zone, mm. because it wasn't just about reading different publications, but I also got exposed to a lot of data, GIS, and these are some of the things that I didn't know about earlier. So this research was very critical in helping me understand not just floods, but also the broader part of climate change. So talking specifically about floods in Pakistan, yes, water has obviously been one of the major issues. But of all the things that have happened and that have led to floods, I think governance was the major issue. And how the mismanagement of resources by the government led to these catastrophic floods that submerged one third of the country underwater. So I can just um, give you a few examples. For instance, um, the groundwater resources are depleting at a rapid rate um, in Pakistan. And that's because almost every other farmer who can have access to tube wells, they have tube wells on their lands, and tube wells are very good at pumping out water from the ground at a very rapid rate. So that's leading to a depletion of groundwater resources. And that is also where governance is not playing, a, or the government is not playing like a massive role in helping farmers realize that this can be a major potential issue that can also impact your agricultural produce in the future. Then also other things, for instance, we have three major dams that are regulating the flow of water in Pakistan. And sedimentation has been such a major issue that has actually reduced the capacity of these dams to hold water. And the governments are not doing anything on that. And um, what are the other examples I can give? Also, um, so we have some organizations, like we have some conventions, um, like the Indus Water um, River System Authority and different accords. And most of these conventions are heavily dominated by one party or one specific province. So that province has a lot of agency as to how they can control the water flow and how they can control different resources that are related to agriculture that are very important to securing livelihoods of people in Pakistan. So governance has been a major issue. That is something that uh, needs to be um, addressed. And. Um, what was the other question? It was about governance, right? Governance yeah. what? Yeah. So yeah. governance has been a major issue and the mismanagement of resources based on that. So this goes along with one of the questions that, uh, that we've gotten in. And again, remind everybody, please share your, your questions that you have. Uh, but there's, there's a question about technology and how do we leverage technology in order to, to create greater water sustainability. And, and your, your answer there, Umaima, brings up, you know, we've got two key issues, right? One is uh, technology itself. What technologies uh, are you excited about or, or do, you, do you hope get developed? But as we know, it's not merely about technology as we've been, we've been hearing from the beginning, right? Um, we have expertise, we have technology that's been developed, we've got implementation issues, we've got governance issues, we've got this issue of social risk and the need to inject more urgency mm -hmm. into, into the discussions. And so opening it up to, to, to whoever would like to sort of take up this, this question concerning technology and, and what's needed. Um, I'd actually like to share two technological resources um, that are related to storytelling. So Fida's story was a part of this ar a digital archive called We Hear You, a climate archive, which commissioned 77 young storytellers. And it, it's a fairly simple process in that we met uh, over about a year in these Zoom sessions and just offered prompts. And the storytellers would simply tell a story. And then we transcribe them, and now it exists on this amazing digital archive. 
Um, similarly, there's an organization called Climate Change Theater Action that commissions plays, short plays, just five page plays, again, from around the world. Um, and again, those plays exist online in this digital database. And educators can use them, performers like myself can use them. Um, and th there's, it's an open resource for anybody to take these stories and use them as they will, and of course, um, you know, making sure that we're crediting them and other uh, guidelines. But so they exist online and it's, Amazing because it's it's simple and accessible, and it also means that uh, you can use them in so many creative ways. I'm not Palestinian; I'm from Sri Lanka, but I'm able to role play and like take on a story and share it as a performer because it exists in this digital archive. Um, but also, a lot of the work that I do is on decolonizing how we communicate science. And we're always looking for an innovation, the next best solution, the silver bullet of technology. But when you think of storytelling, our ancestors have been telling stories for eons. Um, and even just today in one of the breakout sessions, we were talking about ancient Sri Lankan tank cascades uh, that are incredibly valuable in mitigating human elephant conflict, in providing water for irrigation, for agriculture, but they've been neglected because everybody's obsessed with the newest technology. Um, so I wanted to draw both those things. There's amazing resource such as the internet, but also to think about uh, what are ways of our past that we can return to. Yeah, I love that, I love that. So in, in, in my job, I, I deal with educational technology and, and talking with faculty about how to improve teaching and such. Uh, but I always tell people that the most amazing piece of educational technology that we have ever invented is the blackboard. Or, mm -hmm. or the whiteboard of today, right? You know, very sort of low tech and yet so critical and crucial to to, to pass down information as our as our stories. And any other thoughts on this question of technology? Yeah, on, on the storytelling um, with the with our organization here, we started recently um, Young Reporters Program mm -hmm. uh, to basically share the local stories. And with the tech comes another part: is that the accessibility of data. Mm -hmm. We have the tech, but where is the data? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a big part. So. What we try to do is with this program is to basically get equip young people to ask those like burning questions like, okay, I've been I've been looking at this uh, waste here. I mean, do have anybody have the data? How much has it been coming every day? Uh, so we've been working on a couple of schools who have been looking at um, amount of waste generated per home, and they want to know uh, what's the data for every homes in the country. So that sort of curiosity is generated, and to find the data is not easy. So I think. Tech plays a good role. Uh, the young people were using some sort of uh, map which we created to uh, do this data collection thing. So the idea is to basically use tech with, uh, I, I say, like common sense to find uh, what we can do in reducing our small level of impacts at a very household, family level um, actions, which accounts are very big. But it starts from there, and that sort of curiosity we need to generate within young people at a very young level. So Young Reporters for Environment is a great program we've been working on supporting young people to develop that storytelling, critical question asking, uh, and making sure they develop this sort of you know, curiosity from a very young age. Not only they document this, but also they, they, they start working on that. So that's the idea how I think we can convert storytelling, tech, and environment. Mm. I would also like to add, uh, regarding um, uh, integrating new technologies in the water environmental sector, it's very important. The network uh, supported ab uh, about 11 uh, in new initiatives that had new technologies for, female, uh, for females who worked in the, the water environmental uh, sector, uh, both in Gaza and West Bank. Uh, these initiatives were very successful. Uh, they also uh, like helped uh, the, f the females to generate new income uh, or new income gener uh, sources for these uh, for these initiatives. Um, it's, it's also very important because in Palestine, for the water scarce, uh, we have to think out of the box mm. and have to have new ideas how to. Uh, to find new ways to how to to have clean access to clean water and uh, agricultural water and also uh, so so the the new technology is very important uh, I guess uh, that's what we are working on also in the future steps in the network. 
Yeah, so and then the, the deployment and thinking outside yes. of the, the standard lines in order to do that. So I'm, I'm gonna, uh, because of time, I'm actually gonna combine two questions that we've, that we've uh, just received. One about you know, how to successfully mobilize climate action here regionally and another about the, the youth voices that have recently been elevated at COP28. So we heard in the last panel, there are youth delegates right, that are being embedded within the, the COP28 sessions. Um, and uh, sort of sticking on, on some of these, these themes that we've, we've already touched on regarding tokenism, I want to, if you were to imagine either that you were one of those youth who's embedded in the COP28 proceedings, or you were one of the youth who weren't selected to go, uh, but nonetheless you want locally to be involved, uh, what, what advice would you give to, to, to anyone in either of those situations? in order to, to try to make a difference, in order to try to accelerate environmental action. Umayma. I think um, the most important is believe in yourself. And I think youth has a lot of potential to make impact. The, I feel the major issue is that the entire climate governance system is adult-centric. Mm. And the young people, uh, they find it hard to be empowered as decision makers. And I can understand it because if it's an adult-centric place, then it comes with some preconceived notions about the capabilities, about the age, about how much the youth can exert. But I think youth actually has the potential to do a lot if they are given the resources. And I can give you my example. Like when I was researching floods in Pakistan, I, I had the motivation drive to learn about floods, but it was because I was given the resources. I was trusted by my mentor that I can actually do this. So I, so I did it. I accelerated in it. So I think you need to you need to trust them. You need to give them space and the resources. These things are very important. Um, and then it's, and also I think it's important because once you achieve something as a young person, that reinforces your motivation and then you want to do even more. So I think it's about trusting, believing, and all the positive attributes you can think of. Yeah, and, and you raise sort of this idea of that, that social element of risk, right? When, mm -hmm. when you have an adult space and it's just understood, yeah. here's how the norms work. It might not even be explicit or laid out, but that is one of the things that I think youth have to overcome sometimes mm -hmm. in those situations. Even when we think about um, the three characteristics that Malcolm Gladwell outlined yesterday, creative, conscientious, and disagreeableness, I think that last one um, is complicated because it comes with a lot of privilege. Who is allowed mm -hmm. to be disagreeable and who has lost opportunities because they were disagreeable? But I think for youth um, women who have been trained uh, our whole lives to be polite and make ourselves smaller and think within a box and to be diplomatic. I think it's more important now more than ever to think radical, to be loud, to be disagreeable, um, even when it may be difficult, when it may be tragic. And this goes back to again why technology is an asset for us and our generation because it connects us across oceans, across borders, and there's a sense of solidarity. Nishad was talking about mental health. Um, there's so much climate anxiety. And what each of your networks do, what we are doing in places like this, and what social media and the internet allows us to do is to connect across this and have a sense of solidarity, but also be able to elevate our voices. If you are disagreeable and you face backlash for that, how can you leverage your internet presence, your global presence to um, counter the backlash. Mm. Uh, so I, I think those three characteristics are particularly important for our generation and people who haven't been allowed to be creative, conscientious, or disagreeable in the past. Fantastic. And that's, a, that's a fantastic segue to our, our last question that I'm gonna, I'm gonna pose to, to, to each of you. Um, and that is just that you know, my entire life, I've heard the mantra and everybody uses it on all sides, that what we really need to do is we need to do this for the young, right? For, for those that are unborn. And, and there's, a, there's a very real sense in which the youth of today, the, the youth that uh, you are or in the organizations that you're attached to, just are who we've been describing. And to be candid, humanity has failed to take reasonable action on these issues to date. And instead, we're burdening our young with enormous burdens that they will be dealing with for the rest of their lives. So my, my question, which, which gets at what you were, you were beginning to talk about there, Ashani, is how do we make sure that we aren't paralyzed or sinking into despair, but instead pressing forward with 
as, as Gladwell said, right, the kind of conscientiousness, the creativity, and the urgency that we need. Well, I think, well, Amon, if sure. you don't mind, we'll start with you and we'll okay. just go down the line. Uh, well, I believe that uh, uh, whenever we can uh, engage uh, the, the youth uh, in, in uh, the environmental and water issues, as they are young uh, in this way, especially in the educational systems, this way that we could make it more friendly for them to, to like acknowledge the whole situation and uh, giving them also ownership uh, by young ages also encourages, encourages, encourages them or uh, it, it also allows them to, be, uh, to participate more in such issues and topics regarding the water and environmental issues. Uh, so, uh, so I think so that uh, knowledge and uh, and the right education for for the for the youth will help them to acknowledge uh, what is going on in the universe and to give them ownership from a young age because in the future they will be the ones who will be taking the making the decisions and uh, and uh, leading uh, the the situation. So I guess that will make, make it much more easier for them to acknowledge the whole situation and, as I said, take accountability and ownership of the situation. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'll say two things. One is that I think it's incredibly important for us to continue to foster a sense of ecological belonging. Um, as you know, I had an insane journey getting here. I was traveling for about two days. But as soon as I left the airport, I saw swarms of bougainvilleas beside the roads. And bougainvilleas are found in Sri Lanka, which is my home. They're found in Egypt and LA and so many places that I've had good memories in. And when I see bougainvilleas, I know it's going to be, I'm going to have a good time. I'm going to meet some good people. It's going to be a positive experience. And that is my way of connecting to my ecology and my surroundings. And even just yesterday at the end of the proceedings, walking along, uh, just like dipping my toes in the water and the ocean. Um, so I think yeah, getting, getting us out there, I don't know how much we can achieve uh, being in AC rooms, um, discussing climate and discussing water issues and energy issues. So yeah, continue to foster a sense of ecological belonging. Um, but also in thinking about the past, I'm, I belong to many dharmic traditions and we don't believe that time is linear. Time is circular, so I'm not, I, I feel ancient. Um, I'm 23, but I feel ancient, and it's because I, I come with uh, the wisdom, the mistakes, and all of it of my ancestors, and I believe that I, in, in my presence, I'm a combination of the future, the present, and the past. So I think the more we can think of time as circular also is, is another mindset approach and thinking of what can we learn from the past and deploy in the future, which is also in a way our past and our present um, so those are the two things that I hope to see see more of. Well, um, young people are now better motivated to me. At least they have been uh, asking the difficult question to their parents or their uh, older generation. And I still find uh, a, a good part is where the, the intergenerational dialogues, not talking to your father, but you're talking to your grandfathers who really share those wisdom of how they lived. So uh, we want to share about a workshop we did recently with teachers, grandparents, and students at uh, Mashirib Museums here to really understand how the parents led the life against their grandparents. So there was a very contrasting lifestyle, uh, especially in Qatar at least, uh, the way they lived, the way they were consumed. So bringing back to the, how they lived in the past, I mean, of course, like if you look at time is linear or circular, they will reach back to a point that within the, so, so, giving the current situation, they will enjoy what they used to be in the past. But Young people are really motivated. I see they're coming up, asking the hard questions. And also on the COP questions, I want to touch base. Um, now young people having spaces, which is not used to be in the past, like children and youth pavilion, exclusively given for young people. Mm -hmm. a great space for discussion. And COP is no more, um, again, exclusive for only to adults, They're also making the space for young people. The program started by young people themselves, making sure they support other young people who are not privileged enough to go there. Like Arab Youth for COP was a recent initiative started to help young people to get into COP, especially from the Arab region where most of the countries don't support young people from their national uh, delegation, or their countries are in shambles. They're not able to ever reach there, for example, from Yemen or Libya or Syria, people are not ever able to travel. Visa restriction or other restriction puts them not able to go. But I think young people are coming together to make sure you bring them all together. And that's like a sort of uh, a collective action I see. 
um, uh, there's a tapping from one other to another shoulder from the region, which I really see. It's a great momentum which is built globally. And I see that sprouting out in the region as, as well, beyond the political lines. So I think that's a positivity we should uh, really support and look forward for. So I'm just going to emphasize and expand a bit on my earlier point. So we need to empower youth as decision makers. So we should make sure that in the public sector, private sector, they are given the responsibilities of doing preliminary research, policy formulation, agenda setting. But then when it comes to COP28, it's a very global platform, right? And what you need to understand is that youth is not a homogenous entity. Everybody has had very different experiences of climate change. Somebody in Pakistan who has experienced floods is not going to have the same perception of climate change as somebody who has experienced droughts. And as a result, they're going to have very different philosophies of climate change. So if I go to COP28 and I say that I'm representing Pakistan, the youth of Pakistan, that won't be very fair mm -hmm. because everybody has very different experience when it comes to climate change. So that is one thing that needs to be realized and asserted a lot. And um, based on that, I think the more you empower uh, youth on a local level, the more impact that is going to have. Actually taking into account how different people around the world are experiencing climate change, that is important. Absolutely. Well, I will, I will just close by saying that it's been one of the real privileges that I've enjoyed that I every day get to work with the young. Uh, that is where my hope uh, my ability to stave off paralyzation or despair, right? But, but be truly energized and move forward and try to accelerate this work comes from. So thank you, everyone.